The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, what we're going to do today is first start off with a little bit of the theoretical background for how we might understand epigenetic processes in autism. Those epigenetic processes become treatment targets for biomedical interventions that hopefully help us make the body more resilient and help children that we're working with who have autism to do better. So the first half will be some of the background for how this might work. And then in the second half, we'll go through some assessments and treatments and things that we're trying to do here at UCSF and in collaboration with a number of other centers to show what works for which kids, which is part of the trick. Not everything works for every child. And we need to determine what it is about the child, a particular child, that allows us to make a more personalized approach. So that's the outline for the day. And I'll spend about 35 or 40 minutes doing that. And then we'll have an opportunity for a dialogue and back and forth question and answer. So I'll start off with a disclosure that I am on advisory boards for Biomarin that uh, makes a compound called tetrahydrobiopterin for Forest Laboratories for their work in uh, using Mementine, an Alzheimer's drug for autism, for Coronado Bioscience that's looking into using um, an immune boosting hookworm, uh, for BioZeus for a compound that they're studying in Brazil, and for Janssen for a, a technology that will help parents keep their information better and, and organize it. I've also been doing trials in the last year for Autism Speaks, for a methyl B12 study that I'll tell you about, for Biomarin, again, using tetrahydrobiopterin, uh, for CureMark, for a digestive enzyme that I'll tell you about, Forest, I'll tell you a little about the Mementine study, Roche, we're just starting a study using vasopressin, which is related to oxytocin, vitamin D, where we're using high doses and monitoring carefully for vitamin D, and from the National Institute of Mental Health. So I'll try and mention as I go through each of those studies that it's something that we have received support for, but I want to start off by letting you know that I have that um, disclosure in terms of ways that I, my research group has received funding. So. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of these first slides except to try and make a point. I think we know that there seems to be much more autism that's being recognized now than there has been previously. If we look at that overall, there's been a greater than 600% increase in the prevalence in just the past two decades. So we've seen a tremendous increase. And then we struggle, is that of incidence, actual new cases, or is that of prevalence, in a sense, recognized cases? And there are lots of theories, and there's lots of controversy about what it is. Some would say, well, it's diagnostic expansion and substitution. When we move from DSM-3R to dsm 4 things change. So maybe that accounts for it. And yet, that change occurred in 1994. So you wouldn't think it would still be continuing on now today, almost um, 30 years later. There is the change that's coming with DSM-5 that will produce another kind of change in how we look at things. But we think we've had pretty stable statistics for 30 years. Maybe it's better reporting. We recognize it better, and we report it. Or maybe it's even increasing acceptability, that people find the diagnosis, gets them services that they want, so they're, they're willing to accept that diagnosis. Or people move to areas that actually measure how many people have autism in order to get services. Most studies have indicated that maybe 50% of the increase might be due for this, to, to these kinds of factors. 
but the other 50% we really don't know. And people say, well, maybe it's due to environmental toxins, maybe to infectious or immune vulnerability, or what we will call epigenetics, and I'll tell you a little more about now, the way that genes express themselves, the way that genes interact with the environment. So we know that autism is a genetic disorder, a strongly genetic disorder. We find lots of genes that are associated with autism, and they're usually not even the same genes in everybody that has autism. We find a gene that may account for 1 or 2 percent at the most of cases of autism. So we generally think there are many, many genes that interact with each other and likely interact with the environment to create the disorder. But we know that, that if we look at identical twins and fraternal twins, where people have the same genetic structure or have different genetic structure, that it's higher among those that have the same genetic structure. There are other studies that look at family members and how we might look at genetic factors, finding certainly there's a genetic component here, but we only find a clear genetic etiology and only about 25 percent, and that may even be a generous percentage given to of, of autism cases that we see. So we see hundreds of genetic mutations, some of them brand new, that didn't seem to relate to any family member that we can find, and leading us to say there are many ways that we can develop autism, and maybe then many ways that we should be considering treating it. So you say, what is it in the environment that causes this? What's the in environmental interaction? And the fact is we don't know in most cases. We do know that prenatal or early postnatal exposure to viral infections like rubella seems to be associated with a higher incidence of autism. Being exposed to dep Depakote, valproic acid in pregnancy, or to thalidomide, the uh, anxiolytic, the, the medication for anxiety and for sleep difficulties that was given to moms uh, many years ago is also associated with a higher incidence of autism. But those are the only ones that we really know for sure. There have been a lot proposed. The influence of mercury in our environment, like mercury in fish, mercury in coal dust, mercury in a variety of other places that we might get it, lead seems to be put forward as a common thing that may lead to autistic-like symptoms, environmental toxins, vaccines, the lack of vitamin D have all been proposed. Also parental age, it's been most replicated that it seems to be older fathers, but sometimes it's older mothers as well. And people think maybe that has to do with the amount of environmental toxins that your body accumulates over time that affect the germ cells. The cells that lead to the embryo being formed in the first place. We also find that maternal and metabolic conditions play a role, and people have put forth the idea that influenza and fever are at least associated with autism, and as we talked before, genetic susceptibility. There are things in the environment that people put forward as at least being strongly associated with autism. So. The closer you live to a coal-burning plant in Texas, especially if you live downwind from it, the higher the incidence of autism and other developmental disorders in your family. Or if you're exposed to traffic pollution in Los Angeles near busy freeways, there also seems to be a higher incidence of autism that's associated with that traffic air pollution living near uh, places that spray pesticides. So in the Central Valley of California, those people that live closer to places that were growing and spraying pesticides um, had a higher incidence of autism. And migrant parents who were also exposed to more environmental um, uh, contaminants seem to also show a higher incidence of lower functioning autism. Now, those aren't cause and effect. We don't say that we know that this led to this, but we can say there's a strong association and there are many, many more studies that we could mention. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because we're saying, how do we develop a model for autism? How do we understand 
somebody says, what causes autism? For the most part, we'd say we don't really know, but we do know that there is a strong genetic neurodevelopmental underpinning or vulnerability, that there are genes that seem to play a role. But there's a second part that seems to have to do with environmental stressors and an interaction between these environmental stressors and with that genetic neurodevelopmental vulnerability. So we could say, well, maybe we can't do a lot about the genes, but what could we do about the environment? Or what could we do about this gene-environment interaction and the way that that's leading genes to express themselves that might help us prevent autism or improve the outcomes for autism? The third hit or the third stress comes when we think of autism as a hopeless disorder, a disorder that we can't do much to help people with. And so, as we did many years ago, we suggested that kids maybe be put in institutions or at least in schools where they didn't receive good intervention. And sure enough, those kids didn't do well because no one was interacting with them to try and help them do better. A parent the other day reminded me, too, that we should really emphasize here that that especially happens with adults who age out of their ability to be in services or uh, to get the kind of help that they might need. So adults with autism often get very restricted services and don't do well because they have trouble accessing those, but it can happen at any age. So we're going to talk just briefly about endophenotypes, which has to do with this whole epigenetic thing that I'm talking about. The phenotype is the way that we are, the way that we look, the way that we act, the way things are on the outside, the full picture of the expression of our genes and the way that they've interacted with the environment to lead to who we are right now. The end of phenotype is really a kind of internal, more internal expression, not all the way down to the genes, but what's between the genes and the phenotype, the part that is expressing itself in different ways that the body works and functions. And we'll hear more about this when Martha Herbert gives a talk in a couple of weeks for one of these webinars where she really spends a lot of time talking and thinking about endophenotypes and the way that they develop. And she has an excellent book on this subject as well. But there's a growing literature in autism talking about this epigenetic cause, this endophenotype, and how we can identify it and how we can then use it to target our treatments. The endophenotype is closer to the site of what actually causes the, the, the difficulty than just a diagnosis, like saying someone has autism. And it comprises all the areas that are under genetic control. Epigenetic changes might become permanent, and they may even get passed on to future generations. There are studies indicating that uh, in mice and in humans that having this particular epigenetic change can be passed on to, to children and even to grandchildren based on things that have happened to that genetic expression in the way that it comes out. And all of this suggests targets for intervention. Let me try another way to kind of tell you about this, to, to show you graphically what we might be talking about. If we were to see the developing brain as a slice through the Earth and say that the center of the Earth is the DNA and the outside of the Earth is where we see the symptoms, then there's all this space in between that has a lot to do with how kids grow their brain. It's not just the DNA or it's not just what you see in the end in the symptom. It's what's happening in between. I was reminded of this when I was visiting France a couple of years ago when some people were taking me to a winery saying, you know, the way that we grow such good wine is through the terroir, through what's in our land. It's, it has to do with whether the soil has a lot of lava in it or a lot of sand or a lot of clay. But it also has to do with how much sunshine and rain uh, that we get. But even more than that, it has to do with the people who till the soil, the people who put themselves into that soil that create a great terroir 
or a great wine. But for our reasons here, we're in some ways talking about terroir being the epigenetic way that a child is growing their brain. What happens in gene expression through the messenger RNA expressing itself? What happens in cell modulation in the way cells divide and grow? Or in physiologic processes like immune function or oxidative stress? Or in neuromodulators, how much serotonin or how much other kinds of neurotransmitters do we seem to have further down the line? And then, even further down the line, what do we see in brain structure and function and in cognitive symptoms, but then finally those symptoms in the end. But it's all those layers that we should be thinking about when we think about autism and think about how can we make a difference. One point I was giving this talk saying that perhaps when we're only treating symptoms, we're treating only the surface of the earth. And if we're only using, say, behavioral interventions like ABA or other kinds of more behavioral kinds of treatments, that we're treating only the surface of the earth. But it was pointed out to me that really when we make those changes on the surface, that we're affecting things that happen further down. We're affecting not just one layer, but multiple layers. And that's why I put the little arrows on the side to indicate that when we affect things further down, we affect things further up. But when we affect things further up, we also are changing the structure. We're changing the terroir of what we're actually seeing in all the things that we're doing. So you say, well, could you say more about what that is? What does that look like? Well, that gene-environment interaction has to do with things like immune abnormalities and inflammatory processes. And there are a number of good studies indicating those play a strong role in autism or oxidative stress or disturbed methylation or mitochondrial dysfunction. And we're going to talk more about all of these in just a few minutes. Mitochondria are the little energy bunnies that drive our cells. But sometimes in people with autism, at least at some time during their development, they seem to show that those little energy bunnies, those mitochondria, aren't working as well as they might. Also things like free fatty acid metabolism or excitatory and inhibitory balance or imbalance and then hormonal effects. And I'll talk more about each of these in just a minute. Part of the challenge about doing this kind of research is not every one of these processes are happening to the same extent all the time. We might find at one period of development there's much more oxidative stress. Maybe that's the result of an inflammatory processes that happened even before then. And maybe that leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. But we need to know what's an active process. What's happening now so that we can say the intervention that we're making is targeting that process? Because we could use an intervention that's targeting something that happened a while ago so it's no longer as relevant, that it doesn't make a difference. So it leads us into trying to find biomarkers, tests from the blood or the saliva or the cerebral spinal fluid or the skin or a variety of other places that we could use to say, this is an active process now. So if I target it with an intervention, then I can make a difference in how this, this body is functioning and then how this child with this body is actually functioning. We can target our interventions towards different symptoms, symptoms that we might see closer to the surface with, say, ABA, or in the middle part, level two and three, with things like diet or hyperbaric oxygen, or at level one through genetic engineering, which probably we're not going to do right away. But I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that shows how those might map on. But let me tell you a little more about what those interventions might be. And first, what kinds of biomarkers might we use to measure them? So when you go to see a doctor with your child with autism, the doctor may say, I want to do some lab tests. For the most part, we haven't found any particular lab test that is reliably always really something that tells us something meaningful about autism. So most traditional doctors will do a careful history. They may do a physical examination, and they say, 
you know, maybe I need to do some blood work, or maybe they say, you know, your child looks healthy, I don't think I need to do any. There are other doctors that say, no, we can learn a lot from some of these lab tests about how the body is functioning in these epigenetic processes, and we, we're going to do these additional tests. Well, the tests that people would think of doing more routinely are things like a metabolic panel, a CBC, a complete blood count. Maybe they'll go on and do a few other tests, but some will look at magnesium or selenium or zinc copper ratio or vitamin C or vitamin D3. But not every doctor will, and those that don't will say, you know, there's not a good indication that these tests are fully worth doing. There are things, too, that they may look for, like fat-soluble vitamins or iron. They may screen for lead or amino acids and urinary organic acids. Some may look for cholesterol. There's some indication that cholesterol is often very low in people with autism. They may look at folate or B12 levels or ceruleoplasm. If they're looking for genetic workups, and most people believe that it's worth doing at least a CGH array, a general look at people's genes to see if they might be one of those 25% that have a known genetic cause, may not lead to a different treatment but at least you know that you have a genetic cause. And then some research centers are doing studies looking at gene expression that actually look at the messenger RNA and the transcriptome. Some laboratories are trying to look in some doctors at oxidative stress. The one that's the easiest probably to get is looking at glutathione but the one that seems to be the most reliable is the ratio of glutathione that's oxidized compared to glutathione that's more reduced. And there are a variety of other tests up there, but none of them have really been shown with the kind of, you know, standard double-blind placebo control or, you know, this is really a useful test kind of thing that would lead insurance companies to pay for all of them or would lead doctors to order every one of them unless they saw an indication. Same with mitochondrial dysfunction. Looking at lactate and pyruvate may be an okay screen, but it still doesn't tell you definitely, and it may not tell you often enough to make it a worthwhile test. Some look at carnitine. Some look at creatine. Others look at other measures up there, but it seems that there isn't one standard. The same with immune or inflammatory processes. Some doctors will get a good immune panel looking at IgG, IgM, IgA, IgE. Some may do just a quick screen of something like C-reactive protein that people say is too many times uh, vague or broad to tell us anything useful. Others will gather a stool sample, while others say just asking with GI questionnaires is enough. So, Others will look at hormones uh, and may look at uh, do a thyroid screening test. Others will look at things like cortisol levels, and oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, some look for allergies or measures of things that might be toxins. And some will even gather cerebrospinal fluid to see if those might help us see things that are actually bathing the brain but in a fairly dramatic test of at least putting a needle into a child's back when done by somebody experienced, it's not that serious, but still many people feel a little bit of reserve about doing that routinely. If someone's having seizures or has regressed, there's an indication for an EEG. And for research, people are doing structural MRI, quantitative EEG, uh, looking at uh, spectroscopy and wearable monitors of looking at things that might measure the autonomic nervous system. When you look at each of these things, however, there aren't any of them that you would find a kind of general recommendation. These are things we ought to do. You go see one doctor and they'll do many of them. You'll go see another doctor and they won't do any of them. And we recently did a had a meeting of some of the most forward-thinking doctors that we thought of doing a number of these tests. And we talked about which ones do you think should be standard. And, you know, we couldn't get a total agreement from any of them about which ones should we be doing routinely. 
they'd say, well, I do this sometime, or I don't do this other times. And we tried to, to arrange a study where we'd ask them to do many of them or all of them. And then some of them said, well, this is my favorite laboratory. And some of them said, no, this is my favorite laboratory. And so we wound up not arriving at some kind of a consensus about this is what we ought to do for all kids with autism. So in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you about how we resolve that in a study that's ongoing right now that hopefully will help us resolve this. Not only, though, are we challenged with what tests to do before, we're also challenged with the number of different interventions that we can use and whether we have good biomarkers that tell us this is the right thing to do for this particular kind of biomarker abnormalities, the right treatment for the right abnormality. So as I mentioned before, we could target treatments. We could look at methyl B12, say, or omega-3s if we're looking at physiologic processes. Or we could look at nutrition there. Or if we're thinking about an inflammatory process, we could wonder, could HBOT make a difference, hyperbaric oxygen treatment? Or if we're looking at immune abnormalities, could we use immune boosters? And there haven't been really clear correlational studies showing that one thing works for one particular biomarker, in part because the research is difficult to do. But some of the strategies that we've used or that are being used are, if we're talking about immune function or inflammatory processes, well, while we use melatonin for sleep, there's also indications that melatonin makes a difference for immune and inflammatory processes. Same even with probiotics that seem to be helpful in these ways. IVIG, giving immunoglobulin through the vein, seemed to be something that would perhaps really boost immune function. But the great majority of studies have shown that doesn't seem to work as well as we hoped it would, although there are still some practitioners using it and saying that they get good results. Corticosteroids have been given to some people that seem to show immune abnormalities, but again, no good studies uh, that, that indicate they work for all kids with autism. Non-steroidal steroidal, anti-inflammatory agents have been used for some kids when we wonder about this. And I have some parents tell me that when they have a child having a particular tantrum, they notice a benefit even when they give their child uh, aspirin or ibuprofen that seems to make a difference. And there are some studies looking at really kind of stronger non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents that seem to show benefits as well. Things that might improve methylation include things like folic and folinic acid. And things that might include mitochondrial function include carnitine, coenzyme Q10, vitamin C, a variety of others. But again, studies indicating that these really work for all kids or which kids they work for still have not been fully done. Oxidative stress, glutathione, methyl B12, curcumin, neurotransmitter production has been targeted with certain different kinds of medications that are listed there. GABA has been shown to be benefited by interventions for fragile X like arbaclofen. Um, and there's a recent study out of France that talked about using bimetidide, uh, a diuretic that seems to help with the GABA system and help kids with autism. Glutamate also has shown some mild benefits, looking at Rilluzole and decycloserine, but again, modest benefits, not big ones. And we'll talk a little more about some of the others. This was just a diagram showing all the different things that have been proposed to help mitochondrial function. These were proposed actually by drug companies, people who worked at drug companies saying all of these medications might improve mitochondrial function and then might have some applicability for kids with autism that show diminished mitochondrial function. But again, we're waiting good studies to show whether these really work or don't work. The challenges in these studies is that the effect the change that one sees is usually not a big dramatic effect. You see a big dramatic effect when you see a child with ADHD and you give them a stimulant medication. That makes a difference in a day. 
And so you can show a change there. But when you're showing a kind of change for many of these interventions we just ran through for a child with autism, it's a small change that occurs steadily over time. So then you have to hold other treatments steady. So you could say, well, it's not being due to this other thing that I'm giving them. I'm only doing this one thing. And then there are ethical problems of saying, well, you're holding everything steady. But if you do a whole bunch of things at once, you know, know which ones to hold accountable. Also, we know autism is so variable. Maybe we're missing the end of phenotype for the child that really does well when we enter all kids with autism into a study. We may do a study without a biomarker that helps us know this is the child that's going to make a difference. And we may even find that the formulation of what we're using varies between the different labs that are making it. We found some variability, say, in methyl B12 between which lab are we actually using or between omega-3s. There's also a problem of getting the Institutional Review Board to approve what you're doing. And there are ethical issues of asking people to hold things constant or not go into new studies. Many of these treatments are not patentable, so pharmaceutical companies are not interested in funding them. Or because the studies take a long time and may or may not work, it's often hard to find a big funder that will pay for that long-term study with the risk that maybe it won't work. But there are some studies that we've been doing and I'll tell you about, and then we'll move on to an opportunity for questions. The study that we've designed to try and think about how do we deal with all these biomedical treatments? How do we understand all the tests? How do we understand who they work for? And how do we understand how we can better target treatments? Is a study that we're calling the Autism Translating to Treatment Project, the AT3 project. What's really helped hugely in our getting this study going is a generous gift from the Jane Botsford Johnson Foundation. And we've been starting it here at UCSF, but we're collaborating with four other sites around the country that are doing integrative medicine or biomedical treatments. And we've developed a whole web-based system to gather good information and to enter that, to have parents enter it and to have the, the doctors enter it and to do standardized assessments that would be used to say, are we really making a difference with this biomarker and this treatment? So we hope that we can develop integrated, comprehensive, science-based assessments of biomedical mechanisms involved in the etiology of autism, which will then help us evaluate the efficacy of targeted treatments for autism and related neurodevelopmental disorders. I've gone through the epigenetic explanation for why we think this would make a difference. And you know, for me, what really is the most important is I feel like many of these treatments are helping the body feel more resilient, help it be more resilient. I worry when for a child I need to think, you know, the only treatment I have that really is going to make a difference at this point is something like Risperdal or Abilify or others. Not that they don't make a difference and not that I don't use them. But I wish that I could use something that helps the body in this gene-environment interaction to push back, to be healthier, to get to the point where maybe they don't ever need the Risperdal, or where we can use it along with those things to help the body do better. And I believe these biomedical epigenetic assessments leading to targeted treatments is the way that it happens. And I believe that this study is going to help us know better who they work for and make this much broader in its appeal, rather than the small group of doctors that are doing it based in part by, on their intuition or their knowledge, but now based on a stronger science that will convince the larger medical community that this really works. I see it work. I think some of you have seen it work. I know that there are good doctors that I respect that see it work. We're hopeful that this study is going to help us know better how to spread that, that knowledge further, uh, because it's not being widely used. We've talked about the difficulties in doing randomized control trials. I wish that's what we could do first, but we think we need to know more about it to know whether it's really going to work.
And we think that's going to help us create a more personalized, precision kind of medicine. And we have large data systems here at UCSF that will help us analyze these large data sets that will come from this study that's gathering sites now from four, but we hope at least to have 20 sites up in the next few years. So the study is is, is an open label study. It's a practice-based longitudinal study that will hope, hopefully give us a proof of concept to give us greater power to examine these associations and then to propose a larger multi-site study that we can hopefully get funded to help us know better how these treatment works. Once we get specific biomarkers and treatments and know about the potential efficacy this network can then establish large databases, which is kind of what cancer did when they were first getting started in finding good treatments for cancer. We'd like to develop that kind of large system that would really help us know what works in a broader sense for these treatments that are not necessarily the standard, most accepted treatments, but that hold great promise. We're using a number of different measures and you're welcome to my slides to look over these. At some point, I won't go through them all now for the sake of time so that we have time for questions. What I'm going to do is close in the next five minutes by telling you about some of the studies we have been doing here that are not this broader, what works for all these broad places, but what makes a difference for, uh, for certain kids that might work. We have an ongoing study right now looking at vitamin D, which we think helps the immune system. We're using high doses of this for kids with autism, and we're measuring carefully whether those high doses become toxic. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and you may have read some of the recent studies say, suggesting that vitamin D may be preventive for autism, may make a difference for kids that already have it. I supplement the kids I see with vitamin D, not with very high doses, but with high doses, but we're doing this study that allows us to use higher doses than usual. And we hope that that's going to help us know better which kids will do better with higher doses of vitamin D. We did a study of hyperbaric oxygen look at in, looking at inflammatory biomarkers, cytokines. Well, the, the, the 9 out of 10 parents said they felt HBOT made a difference for their child. We didn't find any changes in the cytokines that helped us know that that was the mechanism that was leading to the improvement. And other studies of HBOT for kids have been mixed, suggesting either that there might be a subgroup of kids that we need to more carefully identify before we use it for all kids, or maybe it only works at certain times. Methyl B12, when I was the executive director of the MIND Institute, I pulled in a group of people that were these more these doctors that were more open thinking at the time they were called Dan doctors or integrative medicine doctors or complementary and alternative medicine doctors now they have other names but I asked them which test do you think we ought to study that might make the most difference for autism and they all agreed it was methyl B12 we did one study that showed indeed that it made a difference for about a third of the kids but not enough of a difference to have the active methyl B12 separate from the placebo, but there were biomarkers that indicated which ones seemed to make a difference. And we're now doing a study sponsored by Autism Speaks that we hope to have the results for very soon that will indicate better which kids might respond. We did a study of omega-3 showing again that there was a trend towards improvement in these kids uh, taking the omega-3 fatty acids and that they separated from those kids taking placebos. We are been part of a study looking at memantine, Namenda, an Alzheimer's drug. And I think the word is kind of out that sadly uh, the active didn't separate from placebo in part because the placebo group showed improvement as well. I think it was our impression as well as the impression of others that the memantine, which works on an excitatory neurotransmitter, did lead to improvement but it didn't show up in this study. We've also been studying a pancreatic digestive enzyme that uh, has finished enrolling subjects, but has not yet announced its data about whether it's shown improvement or not shown 
So the Methyl B12 study you'll see in your slides, the one that was published is listed in the 30 subjects and the 55 new subjects that we've added are just getting finished in the data and analysis. The Namenda study, as I mentioned, had shown a lot of promise in case reports, but at least at this point, looks like um, it may not work for everybody or work enough that it separates from placebo. The pancreatic digestive enzyme had shown some promise, but the final results aren't in yet. And there have been other groups looking as well at cerebral folate deficiency done from Richard Fry's group at Arkansas Children's Hospital, and acetylcysteine done by Antonio Hardin at Stanford, melatonin, an excellent review by Dan Rosignol, mitronutrients, a good study done by Jim Adams, and then oxytocin has been getting a lot of press recently. No definitive study saying that it works for kids with autism, but lots of studies suggesting that theoretically it may be a benefit, and some smaller studies saying that it looks like it's going to turn out well. So the cerebral folate deficiency study done by Richard Fry and his group indicated that a number of kids that they found with CSF looking at folate levels seemed to have a folar receptor autoantibody that showed some improvement with high doses of folinic acid. That was a smaller study and they're looking at a much larger study to begin to show better which kids might show this benefit perhaps without having to go as far as doing a spinal tap to figure that out. The N-acetylcysteine, the NAC study, showed that there was that placebo that active separated from placebo on irritability. But people are also finding that NAC seems to be a benefit for kids with skin picking and repetitive stereotype behaviors and seems to have a very good side effect profile. Melatonin, a good meta-analysis done by uh, Rosignol and Fry indicating that it shows that, that melatonin does seem to make a difference for kids who are having sleep difficulties, uh, who have developmental disorders, in this case autism, and uh, uh, showing that it's, it's a good treatment to consider trying. And then Jim Adams did a good study of vitamin and mineral supplements showing that high doses of micronutrients seem to benefit kids with autism, especially in hyperactivity and tantrum. So in kind of closing, what I'd say is that it's important to think about medical parts to autism treatment as we're thinking about a full biomedical treatment. One needs to think about genetic causes, one needs to think about neurologic issues, GI, other medical symptoms, and to do a careful, thoughtful medical workup. It's important to think about using speech and OT, and you've had some great webinars on that up to now, thinking too about diet and other things that might make a difference. There's also a clear benefit shown from behavioral treatments, and you've had good webinars looking at that as well. And then thinking about associated symptoms, there are pharmacologic agents that might be indicated for certain kinds of behavioral difficulties, uh, and there are some good studies showing FDA indications that there are indications for that. But what we've really talked about today and what I'm encouraging doctors that I talk to and work with and hope that I have increasing evidence to show them are to consider biomedical treatments as ways to improve resilience in kids that have this gene environment interaction that in some ways they're losing that battle and heading towards autism with the hope that we can push back that we can push them back towards health, that we can stake them like a plant that's not growing in a healthy direction and help them grow better. And the studies that I think at this point would indicate we could use these treatments fairly routinely in kids with autism include those for melatonin, for omega-3, for vitamin D3, for probiotics, and it's looking more and more like for digestive enzymes. I use those regularly in my practice and recommend them to parents. But there are many more that I think we need to think more about in terms of which kid do they work for and at what particular period of time. So when I was at the Mind Institute, we had this contest where we asked people to submit art from people that had developmental disorders. 
we had a huge number of people that applied from all over the world that submitted their art. 80 were selected in Hang in the Mind Institute. This one's my favorite. It's called The Haircut. It's drawn by a, four, a boy who was then about five, and he used to show or draw pictures of times that he felt a great deal of conflict. This, as I said, is called the haircut. And you can see how this boy is feeling about getting his hair cut. You can see the, the expression on his face, the way he's looking. And you can see this person here cutting on his hair. The bee is probably the buzzing of a razor. But the boy in this situation would always draw an escape route. And you can see here a door of his escape route from this situation that I hope are being able to understand better about epigenetic and biomedical causes for autism will lead us to better treatments and will lead us to prevention. So thank you, and I'm open for questions for the next 12 minutes. Thanks. Okay, great. We've got a lot of questions, so I will just launch right into these now. Here. Okay, here's the first one. Do you have any ideas about how to strengthen working memory, games, supplements, other things that you've seen that were effective? Well, that's a great question. We um, do find that things like omega-3s seem to make some difference. They help more with hyperactivity, but they may help strengthen working memory. There are a number of studies right now looking at games, and gaming, um, you know, on, on uh, iPads and, and computers have been showing increasing benefits. We've been We've just gotten a grant to start using that for dyslexia. We've, uh, our group, our larger group, has been showing benefits for that for Alzheimer's and working memory. And there are several sites now starting to, to use uh, iPad apps in improving working memory for kids on the spectrum. Um, I, I think those, uh, at least at this point, are the ones that have the most evidence. Well, this may not be the answer that everyone is looking for. If someone has ADHD, and about 30% of kids on the spectrum do seem to show strong symptoms of ADHD and benefit from low-dose, carefully used stimulant medication, that's another thing that can have a significant improvement in working memory. OK, the next one. I'm a clinical researcher and a parent. What are your thoughts about interventions of methyl B12 methylfolate, and B6 in subjects with MTHFR polymorphism in an enriched population? We think that the MTHFR is going to be a biomarker for those treatments that you mentioned, the methyl uh, uh, B12, uh, perhaps folinic acid supplementation. And, but we haven't analyzed our data yet to be able to say that for sure. There have been a few groups that have started to show those changes, some I think from Jill James's group and from some other groups, but I don't think that we've looked at that enough to give a definitive answer other than to say, it's my impression we should, should see a change in that area. But I think for those that have looked at this, time, at this point in time, I don't think that the answer has been as definitive as we hope that it will. You say you're a clinical researcher, and if you're looking in that area, I'd suggest doing it. But I'd say that right now we're looking at the MTHFR and the 55 kids that we just ran through our methyl B12 uh, at uh, uh, Roy, uh, uh, Roy Green's lab to help us uh, know better uh, whether that's going to be a useful biomarker to us. OK. The next question, what dose of vitamin D is being used currently in your study? What form, capsules, drops, et cetera? So I think they're asking, how do, you, how do you decide that? I don't know if you can give specific dosage, but it's probably a formula you use. Right. We, um, we used the D drops. Uh, we just found that the drops were a, a little more acceptable. I'm not endorsing D drops. It's just that's the one that we happen to use in this study, uh, uh, and they're liquid. And we do have a milligram per kilogram ratio but I can't tell you that I remember right now, but it generally comes out to be about 6,000 up to as high as 10,000 IUs, which is higher than I would recommend to parents using without someone monitoring their 
D3 levels and there and kind of watching them closely, which is what we're doing in our study. I would tell you in a way that I wouldn't want to have quoted as I'm necessarily recommending it, but for little younger kids I use 1,000 to 2,000 IUs and for bigger kids I use about 5,000 IUs. And I have lots of colleagues that seem to be, you know, no vitamin D well that go up as high as 10,000 for themselves personally. Um, I, I don't think that we have a strong enough evidence to recommend these. We do for kids with rickets, but I have to tell you when I went through our IRB, they were very resistant to our going over 5,000 IUs. So we put, put our limit on 6,000 at least in terms of standard what we're using and monitoring carefully. Uh, but, I, uh, but I do think that that's higher than what you usually hear. But D3 is a fat-soluble vitamin, and you can get into trouble giving too much of it. So if you start thinking, well, a little D3 is good. Let me give them a lot more. It's not a good vitamin to give too much of it. Okay. You talked a bit about melatonin. Is it only used for sleep issues, or have you seen other benefits? Well, there have been studies that indicate that melatonin seems to make a difference for uh, immune function as well. I don't use it solely for immune function, but I suggest it to parents that even though their child may not have um, sleep difficulties, they might consider using it um, for, uh, for as a kind of immune booster. Um, I don't know that the evidence is strong enough to say that's worth doing, but uh, but I use melatonin very regularly, and I use somewhere between 3 and 9 milligrams in kids, and I titrate up slowly to, uh, to use melatonin for sleep. Some would suggest if you're looking for the sedative properties of melatonin, give it a half an hour to an hour before bedtime. If you're looking to reset the body's clock, then you should give that around 7 in the evening, and then think of your child going to bed, you know, at 6 or 7 in the evening and having them go to bed at 8 or 9 at night as a way of resetting the clock and that you shouldn't continue to use it after you set the clock and yet for a lot of kids I've had them taking melatonin for years and each time I try and take them off they don't do well and there seems to be no real harmful effects of kids taking it for a longer period of time. Okay. You talked a bit about inflammatory problems. Are there specific symptoms that point to inflammatory problems in your studies? What treatments might be helpful for these? Well, the kind of most obvious one that you see in younger kids especially is just the presence of fever. You get a fever that comes out of the blue. Why did that happen? It may be related to an ear infection, might be related to a strep throat, might be related to other things or just a low-grade fever, perhaps even kids that tend to get a fever and then develop a rash, or seem to have maybe chronic kind of lymphadenopathy, swelling of their lymph nodes, or things that might suggest that there might be an ongoing um, uh, inflammatory process, looking at the body for those inflammatory processes. Some people suggest maybe that even having a meltdown, having a temper tantrum, is in some ways related to having an inflammatory process and then perhaps treating that inflammatory process with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or at least seeing if it makes a difference um, might make a difference for some kids. I suggest that to parents. I don't think they necessarily wind up making a huge difference in how they're doing but it makes a, sometimes a little bit of difference and then some doctors that I think see people having a much larger immune kind of problem may use corticosteroids or may use IVIG, but that's fairly controversial and should probably be done with an immunologist that's familiar with what they're doing. There are other things that people use as kind of immune boosters or inflammatory decreasers, like perhaps the uh, probiotics or um, uh, or the melatonin. 
Okay, this is a question, um, you know, girls with autism are a little bit rarer than boys, so this is specific to girls. They're asking, in cases where girls with menses are having extreme meltdowns, what are your thoughts on hormone treatments like birth control pills? Have you seen that used or studied? I have uh, at times used or sent someone to a specialist or at least to their primary care physician to try using um, uh, birth control pills, low-dose birth control pills to help with those um, premenstrual symptoms. That, and I have not always, but have at times noticed that there are benefits in doing that. Sometimes two people have suggested that um, antidepressant type medications, SSRIs, may be of help to people that have a lot of premenstrual symptoms. It's not something you can just take only during that period of time, so that's a little more of a problem if one doesn't want to use those more traditional medications. But it is worth at least trying to treat those premenstrual symptoms. Okay. Do you think we, in a child's lifetime, can reverse negative genetic mutations or address them? Well, I think that's a tough question. I, I, you know, when people say, do you see the glass half full or half empty, I usually see the glass three-fourths full. So I'm, I'm usually more positive on things, and I think we're making tremendous strides in understanding um, genetic kinds of changes and ways that we can modify those. And we're seeing that happen now in certain single gene disorders like tuberous sclerosis or uh, fragile X, and uh, we're better able to, in some ways, begin to modify that, and we've shown that we can modify that in rodent models. So it's still a long way from there to humans, and it's a long way from there to say we may find it works for a few, and then does it work for the many. But I think it's going quickly, and I think you know maybe in the next five to ten years will so show some changes. I just co-edited a book with Rondi Hagerman, who's the medical director at the Mind Institute, that's coming out in the next couple months on neurodevelopment and targeted treatments being published by Oxford University Press. And uh, that goes through several chapters looking at these single gene disorders but there's a chapter on autism and a chapter on depression and a chapter on bipolar disorder. And it's talking about how we're moving towards at least changing that epigenetic process and now getting closer to changing the genetic process, at least in some of these single gene disorders. So I think we're at a hugely exciting time. The hard part for parents who have child, children with autism right now is you can say, well, what if you changed their genetic structure when they were 15? Well, they missed out on a lot of development that they're not going to be able to go back and get. So you can still think that they're, they could do better, that things could still change, but you probably can't go back and make up for those things that have been lost if one's not making an early intervention.